back. Um, standing next to me is uh, Dino Petty. Give him a great applause. Thank you. Yeah, we didn't rehearse this when we were supposed to go sit. So shall we just... Can I sit now? Sit, yeah, sit down now. Does this work? <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, Dino, obviously the, uh, uh, the co-founder of and, and former CEO of uh, Playdead, CEO of Jumpship and CEO of Coherence. Uh, my name is uh, Matthijs Eriks. I'm a composer and author and a games industry dinosaur by now. Um, but um, let's talk about your games, first of all, as an introduction, and then we go on and talk about your ideas and experience of founding games companies. Um, first of all, Limbo. I, I, I've asked you to think about some uh, anecdotes for every game <laughs> you made, so I, I, I hope you came up with some good I came ones. up with something. Uh, yeah, so Limbo is the first game I worked on. Uh, sorry, it's the first big game I worked on. It was not the first game I worked on. I worked on other games, um, but it's the first game where I also started a company and had, had a much more control in kind of building the company. Um, yeah, that was the anecdote. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want more? Yes, yeah, something. <laughs> w w why did you use just black and white? So... Um, it was the idea of my partner, but uh, like th at that point, uh, everything was going more uh, colors, um, and I really, really liked that li that that we were trying to go another direction. Everything was going, you know, explosions, noise, and so on. And this was kind of getting back to the roots of what games is. Okay, then the next one. Um, Insight. Yeah. So I mean. <laughs> Limbos was almost practice for the team, and I think inside became more like, you know, we, we had the same core of that team, and then this was, yeah, the perfect spiritual successor for us. Were you expecting the amount of success that you got with it? Inside? Yeah. So fun, because anecdotally, I think more people remember Limbo. Really? Yeah. When I, again, just anecdotally, when I go around to talk with people, there are more, more people mention that and they always say, oh, yeah, I should play Inside at one point. Okay. I, I personally think that Inside is, is, a, better, is a better game. Um, okay. Uh, then you uh, leave Play That to uh, found another company called Jumpship. Um, and you released. How do I pronounce this? Somerville. Somerville. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah I left uh, played it, and I actually, I mean, my first instinct was to do more of the same. So I, I met a director called Chris Olson, and he had this idea that reminded me so much about like the flashback vibe. Vibe. So I, yeah, I, I contacted him and said, yeah, just left played it. Let's talk, and we, yeah. It's, Spent half a year kind of dating, can you say that? <laughs> uh, before we uh, like, uh, asked him, if you want to do it, you know, let's, let's do it together. And we kind of created Jump Ship and, and Somerville. And you do not only, or only, you do not just make games, you also make tools. Can you yeah. tell us what co 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 Coherence just launched the version 1.0? 1 1.0, yeah. Okay, what is it? It's a bit stupid in some ways. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, because after after played it, I was really, really addicted to kind of, you know, doing these m massive things that touched people. And I had this idea that I wanted to make like a huge multiplayer game, you know, more emotional than what you see out there, and something that is that was touching people's heart. And I tried to make, you know, the vision bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, you know, it became almost like, let's make a tool that can help all creative minds in the world make multiplayer games. So it, <laughs> it went to that. You know, when you look at mods, you know, some of the biggest games came out of uh, a small team building upon another idea and getting help uh, without investment, just uh, like the pure idea. And so that was, that was the, 
respond to that? So f the, the, the short of it, it's a multiplayer SDK for Unity. Yeah. And it's... Uh, I mean, now you're making it sound really unsexy. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, I, I just... I, I, yeah, well, these are your potential customers. <laughs> Yeah, well, what we are selling is essentially that it makes multiplayer easy. Like um, I have been avoided it for many years, and many people are avoiding it, and we're just trying to make it easy. We we tried we explained it a bit by saying it's the kind of you know multi, uh, Unity and Unreal, what they did for general game development. We're trying to do for multiplayer, so really make it easy. Make like like when I was younger. Um, I laughed a lot about, you know, people come out of the study and say, oh, I want to make M an MMO. Because you're like, oh, of course, they would never make an MMO. But now that's actually the idea that we want to have. <laughs> that idiot <laughs> getting this idea and doing something uh, amazing with it, right? Okay. Um, I want to go back a bit to the start of your companies. Um, I know you've said in the past that to you, vision is immensely important. Um, well, first of all, why do you think it's the vision in particular is so important when starting a games company? Um, the short answer is that time is the most valuable currency we have. There's nothing else that that, uh, that exceeds it. So. When you when you go for lunch, you don't need to have a vision to go have a lunch. If uh, it's a lunch, what's it called? Yeah, like yeah. dinner, right? Um, when you do something that takes a week or two, maybe you need to have a slide plan. But when you do a games company, you, I don't think I realized, and I don't think a lot of people realize that you're setting off for a journey that takes maybe three, five, ten years. And I think if you don't have a vision of where you want to go. Also, what, what feeling is it you want to achieve and then where is, like, what is it you want to like, uh, go with this? I think you will not manage to, I think you will quit early. I think you need that to, to sustain some kind of, you know, there's so many hard times, there's so many times that it's, it's not fun. Uh, even now, I mean, uh, like, a, 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 like, we can talk about that also, but it, there's, there's so many hard times. Whenever you try to do something out of nothing, which you do often time with games, it's, it's such a hard thing, and then like the vision is just like such a good thing to keep you on track. It's such a good thing to talk with your employees about if you have a company, and and I can uh, uh, and also partners. And I can see especially with my, my employees uh, and colleagues, uh, it's so powerful to talk about the vision because it always keeps you going. Like if morals is down or like just once in a while, um, what I do in coherence is actually I, I make it like a company-wide talk every three months, every half year, where I kind of just go down, um, I bury myself a bit, I come up with some, uh, like, not, not uh, new ideas for the vision, but kind of, you know, what are the developments on the, on the vision, then I talk with my partners and see if they agree, and then, then, you know, I present it for the whole company, and I just feel it's really strong to feel that you're part of something that is a bigger vision, and not just, you know, oh, it's fun to make games. Yeah, it's but th in, in your opinion, because vision is kind of a broad uh, statement, but, but in, in your mind, what should a good vision entail? I, I haven't found out. <laughs> but <laughs> what I think is really important is that you, uh, if you're the one carrying the vision, that you sit down and you find out what's the feeling and what's the kind of, what's the broad outcome, because I don't think it's a precise thing. You, you cannot say it's this or this, I think. You have to, like, uh, you, I want to take over the world could be a vision with, and do something good for the world maybe also. It's also a good vision. And then you can kind of start from that and make, kind of align it slowly with what you're doing. Why is what you're doing good for the world? Um, and, yeah. Money. Is that part of <laughs> your idea of a vision? You know, like, let's get rich? You're leading me very much to the answer. But I, I, th <laughs> I think getting rich is it's, it's such a flat vision to have because if you really want to get a lot of money, I don't think you should be in games. Oh, no, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you hear about a lot of people earning a lot of money, but I mean, it's the 1%. Yeah. And a, I think it's so important that you l learn to love the journey 
Um, the money is, is such a flat outcome, and I think also like, what is what is a lot of money? Like, and you you sell a game, you get I don't know a couple of million, but you cannot live the rest of your life for that. You still need to do other stuff. So I think it's a, l yeah. a couple of million is still a lot of money. <laughs> but these days it, it it goes so fast. You cannot live the rest of your life. You have to do something again. So let's say you get a couple. Of, I, now <laughs> we are getting out of the track, but if you get a couple of million, let's just say two, you can not work for a while. You still need to work on something. So would your first vision be get a lot of money and your next vision be your real vision? Why not have the real vision to start with? And then maybe break it up yeah. and say we also need to survive and, and earn money. Okay, okay. Well, um, since we sort of establish what your idea of, of, of a vision is. L let's try and see if we can uh, get some examples from real life and in this case from, from your life. Um, so what kind of vision was created for Jump Ship, your second company? So we wanted to do a cinematic experience set in a really you know, iconic environment with some really emotional stories. And I think we achieved that in, in large parts. And what you do with the vision is that every time you have a choice, and again, everybody here who has a company or have tried to make a company or, or created a game uh, knows that there's so many choices. And a lot of the times you actually don't know the right answer to the choice. It's so easy to see a game that is released and imagine that that was just all the right choices. But rarely there were so many things that led to those choices. And a lot of the times you don't know what, what one or the other. And then I think like having that vision for every choice, like, you know, cinematic. Okay, if there's two choices, what makes it a bit more cinematic? And, you know, you hold that up to the vision every time. Um, and the same also with employees. I think it's so, e uh, so important that when you hire people that you do the typecasting. You talk about the vision when you hire people and you see how much they feed into it and like preferably add on to it and say, yeah, I can see that, you know, I want to put this onto it uh, because then you know they add on to your vision. Because again, the, the vision, I don't think anybody, also like the great visionaries of our time, I don't think they ever had like a really precise vision with millimeter precision. It's like it's a feeling of something you do in the future. Um, and it can it can be so so strong if you if you present it correctly. I have this this example I saw recently from Elon Musk, which you love or hate, uh, but he's creating this robot, and this robot does nothing. It is actually a bit laughable at what step they are compared to everybody else. But the way he presented, saying that this robot is going to rem all of the tasks you don't want to do in your life, this robot is going to do it. And it's going to do it in a way where we're going to change the economy of how we think about it today. And you were like, boom, right? He sold this shitty robot to us once again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, again, I'm, 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 I'm that. trying to picture it. But <laughs> having a team that understands the vision is uh, very important to you. But and does that also mean that you um, for instance, do not hire very talented people. Yes. That, okay, th th that happened. Yeah, I think it is, of course, important to have talent, but you need talent that understands the vision. And I've tried so many times to work with people that don't fully understand and are always questioning it, and always also sometimes trying to move it towards their vision, which would maybe also be fine, but I still believe in like having one coherent vision per project you are doing, or maybe even per, com per company is really important, and it can, it can really ruin uh, a really great company, a really great, great game um, that you have that. And it also it just ruins the, the process. You know, if you have one visionary, like, and everybody is trying to pull it away from that vision, it very quickly becomes incoherent. And I think we can all, we cannot see it in those games that are really incoherent. Um, very, very few people probably here played the game uh, Scavengers. It was like improbable made this game. 
and they tried to combine survival with Fortnite uh, and Battle Royale and uh, PvE and uh, like in the end, you know, you can just see that they there was no vision behind this. There was no person saying stop. There was all like all big meetings where everybody came up with the most fun ideas. And I I I, I personally believe that the best games we have is where there is one maybe two main creatives that are carrying the vision um, and not like you know a, a a like a group deciding or voting or putting things in um, yeah sort of the author yeah and um, when you scale up a company uh, if, if I recall correctly with a play that you went from like 12 to what was it, 30, yeah, 40 we people? We started two, then we went to around 15, I think, with Limbo. Then we went a bit down, and then we went up to... When I left, we were 28. And so that means, you know, I hired 28 people, but I think I fired at least the same amount, if not more. Or laid off, it's called. Okay. Um, because you get people in, and in an interview, it's hard to deduct really, you know, all things. But this is also relates to other things in vision. They could also just be how they they work and how they fit into the, c the company. Um, but I, I will say typecasting is a lot of it. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of like people that, that didn't make that cut. Okay, so there are uh, a, a lot of uh, indie developers uh, in the room as well. Um, what would you say to them uh, in regards to, uh, to, to a vision and uh, how to translate that to the games that they're making and how to um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to and failing by the way uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get a, a very concrete example of this is your vision, so this is uh, the decision you make based on the vision other than who you would hire and not. So should it influence game design and Every, to yeah. what extent? But I think everything, but I mean, so it is so easy for, for me now to sit and come with it as advice. And <laughs> that's just a disclaimer. <laughs> because I remember as we were doing Limbo, people gave me this advice, we are going to take this company and we didn't know. We just want to finish this game, right? <laughs> and I think that's where you are a lot of the time. But I can see now, looking back, that I should have spent more time in thinking about how, where am I in 10, 15 years, 20 years maybe, where is the company in 10 years? Uh, and and yeah, what we maybe thought about where it was more like, you know, in the local space, where, where are these games going? And, and it's more now, looking back at it, I st I'm starting to understand how important, um, that this, how imp important the vision we set out at that point, how important it actually was. Um, but I think there's also the, there's vision, but there's also the values you, you create around it. And values is, is probably the, the guardrail. Uh, so you, you have a vision. But you also test it up against, you know, what's, what's your values? Do you value gameplay? Do you value making a positive impact in the world? And do you value, like, there's so many, there's so many things, um, yeah, as a government. But, but, but if you look back, and, and um, you, you set out with a plan, with play that, and, and later with jump ship, um, did you feel that you adhered to that plan, to that vision? Did you did you leave it at any point? Um, no, I, I think it, it, it is so important to stick to it. But I will say, like, what I think what you're asking is also how much should you stick to a vision compared to uh, react to the environment around you? Say no to funding if yeah. that would mean a shift. But I think that is that is a spectrum. That is for sure a spectrum. And you can be a visionary purist. And I think my ex-partner in Play That, he was a visionary purist uh, and still is. And I am for sure over the, like, the, the, the average. And then you can all go all the way down to people that just say, 
that say and do anything for money. And I think it's really, really important to be above, <laughs> above the average. I mean, uh, the money you take in can definitely put you down a wrong path. And the reason I start about talking about m time as, as an economy is also, if you factor time into it, if you end up, for example, doing consulting, and that's something I always <sighs> categorically regretted to do, if you start doing consulting, you of course do consulting to not die, but it's also going to be something you do until you die, maybe. If, because you, you, you can never, it, the math doesn't check out, you cannot, it's so, for very, very few companies, it makes sense to, you know, they can make enough consulting that they can actually build original IP on the side. Um, and even the, is this, like, even the people you hire, if you hire something for an original IP where it's all about taking the best thoughts and be, doing the best choices compared to a consultancy job where you hire people to do the most cheap and reliable job, um, it, it, it's hard to shift people around on that. Um, so that, yeah, I would for sure always tend to follow the vision because I think if you don't do that, you end up just doing stuff for money. I think it's, it, it, yeah, this is maybe controversial, but I would rather fail doing the vision. What do you say? You say it's better to shoot for the star and land in the puddle than aiming for the puddle. Yeah, yeah. Well, that dovetails nicely into our next subject, which is founding and, and, and growing of businesses. Um, so you have founded three game companies, um, you must have had moments where you were thinking, oh my god, this is going all wrong, and, and, and we're going down, or, or this is a, this is a, a problem that is too big for us. What, what are the ways you get out of those situ situations? What are the pitfalls that you manage to sidestep? I think it, it's a bit hard for me to think about like a few big ones because I think game development and development in general is one big pitfall. You're rolling down a hill and hitting rock after rock and once in a while you gain balance, but most of it is just uh, elegantly falling down and not hurting yourself too much. <laughs> And it's of course also a bit personal thing because I also like doing the thing we're doing in coherence is so stupid in some ways because it's something new. Nobody's done it before. And we come up with something that is outside of my comfort zone. It's outside of, um, but I also think that's what makes it, makes it fun. And the same with, as I said with Limbo, it was like a game created in uh, going like 180 degrees the opposite of what was happening at that time. It was, I'm so old now that, you know, I made CD games before that, and that was a whole lot of business, a whole lot of business. You could not make an indie game in 2003. Yeah. There was nothing, there was nothing called indie. There was uh, maybe people doing small projects, but before there was digital download, there was, you could not get your idea out and, and distribute it and be successful. But, but, but still, um, if we focus on, on play that for now, um, there are so many, so many indie development studios making great games, not having success, not having financial success. Why would you say that play that did end up being so successful? It's, is there anything that you could translate from that and apply to uh, indie studios in general? But I think making something that is really, really different and noticeable and recognizable. Like you can, you can squint your eyes and be at 10 meters distance and you can still see it's limbo. And I, I think when you, like the big games of today is the ones I think that can achieve that you can do that with Minecraft also, right? You can squint your eyes and, and like, and I, it, it, is, it is much harder now. I, I'm not saying it was not hard then. At, the, at, the, at that point, indie discoverability was not a thing because there was no indie games. It was, it, 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 the, the, the challenge at that point was just actually to make it as an indie game. And we, we, we got investment 
and it was not cool. It was very, very uncool to make indie games at that point. And there was nobody investing in games or indie games. Maybe there was people investing in games, but for sure not indie games. Um, so the challenge was different, but I still think that it's what you can take from that is just make something that's really recognizable uh, and different. And that's also the power you have as an indie game. If you do a game that, I, I mean, I, I saw a game at a, at a, at a show um, somebody wanted, it was a Nordic game, and somebody wanted to show it to me, and they said, like, oh, isn't it a cool game? And it's, it's almost like Ratchet and Clank. I said, yes, it's, it's cool, but it's almost like Ratchet and Clank. <laughs> like, how, yeah. like, I would rather play Ratchet and Clank. Why would yeah. I play this game, right? Yeah. But then there's also some indie games that just deliver so much value and so much crazy new ideas that no AAA game would ever try to do that. There's so many games that have given me so many good feelings because they're doing something different. They're touching me in a new way. They're trying something completely different. And they can do it because they're a small team. They don't care. They, they have something on their mind. And uh, yeah, I think these are the games that, that in general do well. OK. So you founded and, co and or co-founded uh, uh, Play That, then Jump Ship, and then Coherence. And Coherence isn't making a product for gamers, it's making a product for people making a product for gamers. Yeah. So what would you say is the, is the most important difference in having um, a tool studio and a game studio? But it's, it's very, very different. First of all, when I was going around at conferences as a game company, I thought <laughs> the people standing in booth, like third party people, I was like, oh, I mean, I, was, I think it was so, <laughs> what's it called? <laughs> it was just annoying, you know, they want to sell stuff to me and yeah. so on. And now I'm kind of that person <laughs> <laughs> in some ways. The other thing is that I, I kept myself on toes because I, you know, I, when we started Jump Ship, it was the first game is always the hardest and the first success is the hardest. When you had that, it is, not downhill, but it's just easier because you can always refer to the last thing you made. And that's also why I think making the first game is, is just like, get it out there. Don't take too long about it. Um, but then when I shifted to coherence, I, I didn't realize how much shifting an industry would change it because with, with Jumpship, you know, when I was, we, we were getting an um, um, investment uh, in for that. It was a bit easier because people knew who I, I was, you know, and I, I knew a lot of people and I could kick doors down everywhere. Obviously, you have to pitch and show something to get money. But for coherence, I was pitching. Nobody knew who I was. Nobody in that industry knows. But it's sort of the same industry. How could they not know you? I don't know. I, I found out. A lot of them don't know what Indo Inside and Limbo is. I say to them, you know, and they say, oh, I'll check it out afterwards. It's a different <laughs> kind of investor. Yeah. There is game investors that know it, of course, but most of those investors we talk to when it's SaaS and tools and so on, it's, it's not. So in one way, it was extremely hard and stupid. In another way, it was really, really interesting and fun for me to kind of take all of what I learned in how you pitch a company and not just rely on my name and, and kind of pitch it again and, and pitch the vision and go deep down in how, yeah, what is, what's exciting with this vision and how do I live it, d deliver this vision to you in a way where you think it's cool and start to adding onto that. Onto that. Yes. <laughs> Weren't you just looking for another challenge? Yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, that's what I said with the money thing. I mean, I, I've never been in it for the money. I, 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 obviously, money is nice, but I don't care about it. I, I, for me, it's, it's all about the learnings. Like, the, one of the reasons also, uh, uh, Lyft played it, uh, beside a few other things, was also, like, I, I felt I stopped learning a bit. I mean, Insight was immensely cool to work on, but in some ways, some mid-production, there was also less challenge. You know, we were just using our own money from Limbo. There was one time where we thought we needed some extra money in the end, and, you know, it was so, so cool to go out and try to pitch the whole company again. And then suddenly we realized we made some sales and then we had enough money anyways. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, so it was, it was that, like the challenge there uh, in many fronts was, oh, and it's not because there was, there was still a lot of challenges in setting up the team and so on, but I, I still felt, I know, for me personally, I wanted uh, to try something new. And that's why just starting with a totally new team in Jump Ship was amazing. Start with a new vision, a new team, build it up from square, square one, and then coherence, as I said, t 
totally other industry, even though you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't think it. Yeah, it it feels a bit weird because it's it's literally within the same industry. But the, oh, and and talking about challenges, uh, obviously. Um, in the last few weeks, a lot of stuff has happened around Unity, and you are developing a tool for Unity developers. Um, how do you feel about that? <sighs> yeah, it's a bit of a shit show, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, I so we when we were pitching coherence, we actually say one like part of the pitch is that we say that we we do what Unity did for developers coming from doing their own engine to doing an engine. We just do that for multiplayer. But I had to revise that, because <laughs> I cannot say that anymore. Yeah. And I now say we do what Unity did before IPO. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I know the founders really well, uh, David and Joachim, and they are super cool. And when they were running the show, they're so cool people. They're always siding with developers. And the reason we are, we are trying to copy their playbook and coherence is they were just they set up this, they, they call it democratizing games, right? They tried to make games easier to make, more creative, and they managed to do it. Yeah. And I think it's such a cool vision. But something happens when you go IPO. Um, I, I, I actually, I had this uh, very childish view of that, because when I started out, I thought when you go IPO, you get owned by the people. And it's perfect, right? So you get owned by your peers and so on, but that's not the truth, right? You get owned by a pension, funds. Kasse and funds, and like... And they're powerful, and they have opinions. And those only have visions about money, <laughs> right? <laughs> and when you only have visions about money, then you fuck up the vision. Yeah, okay, but Unity never made a profit, so it's... it's so then you squeeze developers, right? <laughs> But I think, I mean, I don't know, to be honest, but that, too much that, about that. But would that be something to, you know, like, okay, we have this uh, a vision of, of bringing a multiplayer to uh, more developers. Now let's change it a bit. So we're going to release, I don't know, on Unreal or on engines that may be still around in 10 years instead of just the next few years. Yeah. No, but so the vision for, co for coherence was always to do... Uh, engine agnostic. Yeah, the engine agnostic. The reason we started with Unity was partly that David was uh, like the founder, uh, one of the founders of Unity. He was part of the idea in the, in the start. And we also thought that the, the people who would choose Unity to develop, to develop their games was also people that would probably cho choose a multiplayer SDK if they wanted to do multiplayer games. So we thought like the same customer that does that, you know, just get a plug-in on top of that and then they have the full stack and they can just launch and scale and never need to say the word server again, just launch a multiplayer MMO. Yeah. yeah. One person from your bedroom with your crazy idea. Um, so yeah, but I mean, you know, that came out and it was obviously, first I, I thought it wouldn't hit us, but I also can see now that it's, they, they did some really long-term reputation damage. And even though I feel that they, they backpedal enough that you can kind of choose that again. I think actually when you look at the reality, what it costs to develop on Unity and Unreal, I still think in a lot of the cases it's still more cheap to Unity. The problem is just that a lot of developers don't trust that anymore. Yeah. Will they change that later? It's the trust thermocline that they went yeah. below. Yeah, but I also think that the, some of the some of the worst things they put in was that it was retrospectively. So you could have developed your game, which a lot of things that people did, release it. Same as buying a car. You look at all the cars, you find out what car fits your economy with all the features it has. And then, you know, one year after the dealership calls you and say, like, now you actually have to pay also per kilometer. Because then you wouldn't yeah. have, cho have chosen that car, right? And that's, that's what happened. Um, and th I think that fact that you could destroy business models of people who released, you know, years and years back. Uh, and, yeah. And, and the whole idea that there aren't apparently not enough checks and balances within this company, yeah, that, that destroys the trust, yeah, I can imagine. And I think also Unity, sadly, was already in a bit of decline because Unreal has done so good marketing. They launched Unreal 5, they do so well on marketing. There's been a lot of games showcasing how good it looks. Um, and to be honest, I know developers who've done 
actually both engines at the same time, and they say it's the kind of same ship, shit, just different places. But I also know when you know a lot of the engines have worked on Unity and know their problems, it is a bit of a grass is greener situation. You look at Unreal and okay, oh, at least they don't have these problems, but they ha they have other problems. Yeah. So I don't know still what, what you should what you choose, but I think Unreal 5 have really gotten a lot of, again anecdotally because we talk with a lot of developers in coherence. I think it's half half of all we meet uh, has chosen to start something on Unreal. Um, yeah. But just uh, on a side note, what would your prediction be on this in this area? How many? I, I can ima imagine most developers will finish that their current Unity project, and how many do you think, percentage-wise, would switch to either Godot or Unreal or another engine? Five. No, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I agree with you. Like the cycle is over. I, people think twice now after like, when next time they, they select engines. More people select Unreal than there would have been people selecting Unreal, but I also think it, it's a wave. I think there'll be a wave over and more people will select Unreal. You will find the things that they struggle with, um, and there will be a wave uh, back to Unity again, and then you know, ho hopefully also other engines like Godot and so on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is it is it is a, a, a tough choice at 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 the moment. Okay, I want to go to our final subject, and then we're going to open up for uh, questions, uh, which is success and failure, and. Um, I was a bit surprised that you uh, told us that um, more people apparently know Limbo than Insight, but for me as you know, like someone working in the games industry, Insight is like, oh my god, this is, it's, it's a masterpiece. How did you feel after coming up of Insight? Coming out of? Yeah, but w w when you finished it. W w w and, and you saw the reception and, okay, let's just create a new game. Or was it like, you know, like oh my God, we've, we've done it. We, I can but never improve on this. <laughs> so it's a very special case for me personally because I, I, I left just after Inside. And so it was a, a mixed bag of emotions. It was because like, I, I knew I wanted to kind of finish that up. Um, and obviously, you know, I came out of played it. Um, I got some money on hands, but I also was very like borderline depressed because I kind of also felt I lost my baby. I kind of built this company up over ten years. I had friends I hired there, um, and yeah. So it was for me. It was personally, it was a bit of a big mixed bag. Like, and it's can you maybe for the people who don't know the story, elaborate a bit more on that? Uh, the what, what, what happened? <laughs> what, why you left? So I will not go too deep into it, um, but there was like me and my partner had some disagreements, um, and it was also happening while I was also thinking about, you know, personally what I wanted to do next. I mean, first first game took four and a half years. Next game took six, um, and he had more crazy idea for the next game. And my estimates uh, at that point, and still, maybe have to up it now, was that that would take eight to twelve years. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so our our conflict combined with me also thinking like I I, I was 36 when I left played it, uh, being 46 to 48 before having the next game out, and also not developing as I said before, not learning like what I wanted to learn. Um, so that that was what prompted it, and then of course it was a bit stupid because I went out then and, and created two things: coherence and jump ship at the same time. Yeah. I felt it went too slow, and then suddenly it went <laughs> it went too <laughs> fast. <laughs> um, in many ways, and it was also a bit stupid. But that's that's just me. I think I I I do a lot of things to the extreme first before I find find the level, uh, and this was kind of part of that. Yeah, but it was yeah. It was like my, one of my biggest worries after I, I left played it was if I could ever create something as big again. 
And I have this a bit stupid anecdote uh, because I was I was really I was I was really depressed and I was really thinking about how what like what can I do when you you're standing from scratch like you know you have to develop that new vision for yourself and for the next thing you know and it's you know, it, it's never easy and I I thought for to myself who who in the world ha had the same problem as me and then I thought uh, <laughs> of all people I thought not. I just tried it. He must know something. Yeah. So I, I wrote him and I, I went to his uh, his office in um, in Stockholm. And you know it's, it's a very weird office he had. I don't know if he still have it. It was like a escape the room puzzle to get into the office. Uh, this was before the sale to Microsoft or after? After. Okay. After after. Yeah yeah yeah. It was just him, his friends and two PAs and a really nice office. You know. And I came into this uh, escape the room puzzle, right? And I was, you know, wow, that's amazing. I was just about to, and then she said, oh, he's waiting for you, so I'll just complete the puzzle. Duk, 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 duk. And then we, we went into the room, like, no. <laughs> so we, I went in, you know, I had a really good talk with him. Um, and then he, like, uh, Valve have just sent him the, the index. And he said, oh, we should, we should try it. I said, yeah, of course, we should try it. And the first, the first uh, thing he booted up was Job Simulator. So I took the headset on and I started playing. And quite quickly, it became super weird because I kind of just lost my job, kind of. And I was playing Job Simulator <laughs> with Notch that also <laughs> lost his job or whatever he had before. And I, I know at one point, I, I really, really felt like, whoa, shit, something hit me in the head. Okay, I cannot play Job Simulator. That's not my life from <laughs> now on. And I had to stop it. And it, it didn't yield so much. I mean, it was fun to discuss with him, but I mean, you know, I mean that, for me, I just, I just wanted to talk with a lot of people that had gone through some, something like that um, to, to find out. Um, I was lucky enough that I was kind of held a bit on, on, on the ground with my family. Um, and I, I think that that saved me a lot um, in kind of slowly finding out and as I said, like contacted Chris and, and started the whole jump ship journey. Um, Are you pleased with how uh, Jump Ship turned out and uh, Somerville? Yeah, but I mean, we had a vision and we, we, we completed that vision. Uh, we're still doing stuff in Jump Ship. Um, so I, I'm pretty happy about that. I think for me personally, it was very, very stupid to do two companies <laughs> at one time. I had this thing also. I thought, you know, hey, Elon Musk, he can have uh, SpaceX and Tesla at the same time. So I can also have two companies, one in Denmark and one in the UK. I can just fly between, you know. <laughs> but you, you're still CEO of both? So technically, I've never been CEO of Jumpship. I always called myself executive producer. Okay. Um, because there was a bit less committal. It's a bit something that you just go in and you do high level stuff and then you, yeah. So your focus is more on coherence. Yeah. And. You also had an investor in Jumpship, or so Jumpship got uh, as investor. Uh, we pitched it in 2019 or something. We got them, and we actually sold it last year to Thunderful. So, um, is that usually for you a goal to have your uh, studio acquired? Uh, or, or is that just something that happens and, and it came on your path and you th thought, well, this is good for me, this is good for the company? I, th I think it depends so much on your personal goals and paths in life if you want to do that. Uh, something like, like play that you'll see, like, you know, I, I sold my shares to Arndt and I, I think they will never do anything with it. His, his vision is just to have that and build those IPs up and do nothing. Um, uh, for me, I think with Jumpship, because I was so uh, stressed with two companies, it was so important for me that we could get an owner that could ensure that the whole company could live on beyond me. Yeah. And that's also, and that's actually one of my personal visions, like for creating companies. I really, really love the thought about creating some things that live beyond you. And that's also why I'm so, talk so much about the vision and values because that, that's what you put into the company and you establish within the culture. Um, and I want, I want all of the 
companies I create to have really good cultures and really good values and really good visions. And hopefully, like my big dream is to create companies that live beyond me. Yeah. And I'm so old now, I start thinking about so Seth, stop right? saying you're so old. I'm older, so... <laughs> yeah, you are mega old. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I, when, when you're young, I just feel like you're so naively. I've th I thought so much about it recently. You have all the time in your life and you just waste all of it. And... <laughs> What you do, right? I see my kids wasting their time now, right? And you want playing to your games, <laughs> yeah, exactly, or playing Roblox. Do you want to like <laughs> shake them, like you know, just do something with your time, right? But Look at that, having two companies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but I think w would you uh, would you give that advice to anybody starting a company to start, you know, like not one but two? No, but no, 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 no. But I also say to people, don't have kids. It's also so stupid. <laughs> but people do anyways, right? It is so hard. You get nothing out of it. Uh, <laughs> if you're lucky, they, they like you. And they, no, I have three kids. You know, by the this way. is going to be recorded. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's a bit before you incriminate no, it, it, yourself. It was, a, person, it was a personal joke, actually, because. You often give people the advice that you do yourself. And, and I remember when we, in, in Limbo, Limbo, we did our own engine. And we met so many people that, we met this um, Swedish company that said, don't do your own engine, it's the worst. It's the, you know, do something else, you know, it, it's really, really hard to do your own engine. And then they started pitching their own engine and talked about how much their own engine was saving them. And that was the key for like, a lot of the success they had. And I thought after that, like, it's like saying the same with kids, right? Don't get kids, don't get kids, but you get, I mean, I have three kids, right? And you get you kids, and it's so easy to say to other people, don't go through all of that. But in I reality, never say that, I love myself. <laughs> I, <laughs> I also love my kids, <laughs> but it's also as hard as it is, is fun. Okay. Questions from the audience, not about kids. <laughs> You know, oh, yeah, hey, you know, thanks for the, the insights and your adventures. It's uh, really, uh, it's really working in my mind. But I was actually wondering, uh, after you took off Job Simulator, did Notch tell you something? Like, wh did he help you in a way moving forward? No, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stop okay. playing this. No. <laughs> All right, next question. Sorry. <laughs> This one over there. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, what advice could you give to uh, indie game studios who try to balance uh, doing business wi with creating a cool game, uh, even though there are maybe one or two people? I, I think it's really impo important to think about the business also, but I would always lean towards creating recognizable. Always go out. I mean, that, that's my personal thing. It's, it's much cooler to go out with a bang than doing something you thought were commercial, that you thought people would like, because in reality, that's not how it is. If you make something, if you make the more commercial choice, it's not always more commercial. I think in the indie space, it's actually more commercial to do something that is crazy and out there. Um, they always do the crazy thing. But again, I also see indies do extremely crazy things and they don't think about how I'm even going to sell it. I love VR titles. I love playing VR, but I don't think VR titles, you can make them so commercial yet. So maybe you should do a game that also works maybe outside of VR. But again, that, that advice, if you said that to the super hot people, they actually started not doing VR. Um, yeah, so I, I would say the advice is to keep the indie side, like make it recognizable. You have to, com you have to compete with the triple A titles and you have have to realize that, they, that those people can, can, they can compete in money, always. They can compete in realism, but they cannot compete in quirky ideas. And on risk. And on risk, right? Yeah. Thank you. More questions? Oh, this is really fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm really... <coughs> Curious about like the experience. Yeah, keep, keep it close to you. Okay, are, are we good? Yeah. All right. So I'm really curious about the experience of uh, 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 funding uh, the company that makes coherence. Yeah. But like in a sustainable way, in the sense of, 
I really enjoy making tools. It's one of my favorite parts of game development. And I'm like, it would be sick if I could make a living off of selling tools. But it's actually not something that's very easy to do. So, and especially if it, the more specialized the tool or the longer mm -hmm. the, the R&D takes, how did you manage to keep the company alive long enough to develop the features of coherence? Or did you have customers from the start? How is that company surviving? So, it's an easy answer, but it's not a good answer. Like, we, we are just running on investments. We're not profitable yet. So we are loaning other people's money to do it. <coughs> but it's, yeah, and I think it's hard not to do that. Because if you do a tool that's easy to make, then a lot of people have done it. And if you do a tool that's hard to make, then it requires a lot of uh, effort. And one thing I realized going into also what we are making is that it's, it's actually deep tech. When you want to do multiplayer synchronization, it's not easy. That's also what we want to help people with, because if you start your own stuff uh, and you think you can do networking, as soon as it goes live into the real world, as soon as it needs to scale, there's so many things you have to take care of. Um, uh, and you know, also, uh, like you saw, uh, uh, what's it, uh, that game company, Among Us, right? When they got popular, they was, they was crashing for three months straight. I tried to get in. Um, so yeah, I, I don't I know how we fund the game country. Right now we're just <laughs> living on of investment. Uh, and it is tough. It, it, it is like you see, like really have compassion when you see those people in the, in the booths st standing at GDC. <laughs> it's a tough job. <laughs> and you also, one of my pitches when I talk about um, coherence is always that when, when Unity was pitching Unity, nobody wanted it. Nobody needed it. Everybody had their own engine or a solution. They were selling something that was a solution for in 10 years. Uh, so it was like, it was a slow process of slowly coming in. You know, and suddenly you have release games after a while, you know, after half a year to a year. And then it goes faster and faster. Then suddenly now, you know, fast forward. Right now, nobody would build a new game engine. If, like, if you have a game idea, you want to build that, and then you use a game, a game engine because it doesn't matter. And that's, that's our thesis also with, with coherence. Like in five years, nobody will build their own network stack. Why should you build your own multiplayer department, network team, and live ops team in, in, in a game company? You just want to have your idea, that's, that's your core, and then you let kind of, you know, you, you buy that off the shelf component. Um, that's, that, yeah. Thank you. There was a question behind you. Right there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank throw you for the throw. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dino, for the talk. Um, I was curious, a lot of people that have had a really big success seem to kind of have so much pressure that they're not sure you know, where to go. Um, I, you know, not, it might be a good example. Um, I'm very curious how that felt when, uh, when Limbo was so popular, if you felt like, hey, maybe we should do something completely different, go into a different kind of vision, or if you felt like, you know, you've talked about vision a lot, if this was like, I want, did you already want to make inside when you, just when you finished Limbo without seeing just how popular it got? Um, so, I'll, yeah, it was my partner that was behind some, uh, a lot of those things, but I think for like the whole company, it was just important to kind of do what we were good at, find the strengths in the team, and then do more of it. Like all positions in the company just got more time. You know, you saw like, because I think a lot of, a lot of the things in, in, in Limbo felt rushed. And it's also, you know, we were building a company while building a game. You were hiring people, you were trying to find processes. And when you already have the structures, you have a place to sit and you have some processes and you learn something, it's, I, th I think it's just easier to, yeah, do like do the spirit success, successor, like give all positions like this game designer just get more time, the sound designer more time, um, yeah. But I think yeah, on a personal front, I think that that's more diff uh, difficult because I think a lot of the people who has success and leave, it it is. I think I, I found out now that people that that have a couple of years of break and then start again, I I think uh, I mean I really have respect for those people now because it's. They're starting not from scratch, but they they have to figure out what to do again. What is it that that made them 
Yeah, start the first time. And I just interviewed actually uh, Christopher Sundberg that made Avalanche on, on scene at DICE. And he said that he just, he knew nothing of what he wanted to do. He just stopped and then he just started playing games again because he had time. And then him playing games, actually enjoying playing games, which is, was what made him get ideas and come back into the game industry. I mean, he came up with the idea of, uh, what's it called? The parachute. Um, ah, shit. The parachute? Ah, uh, Avalanche first game, uh, shooting cars, parachute. Oh, um, just cause. Just cause. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was his first game, right? He sat in the, he sat in the, in his kitchen and just drawed that, and then he <laughs> lost all, the, like, uh, lost for for life in games, and then he came out and played again and 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 got back in. And I think that's that's so remarkable when you can do that. Yeah. Final question. Good to ask another one if nobody else will. Well, apparently. <laughs> cool. All right. Very different topic. But you mentioned, you know, you hired a number of people and you fired just about as much. How, how do you do that? How do you fire people? Like, how, what, what, what does it take for you to go like, hey, you've worked here for three months. I've, you know, it's not working out. Uh, do you have a, a process? How, how does it work? <laughs> um, so... I, I think you just feel it, and you feel how people work in the, in the team. Um, but it, 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 anecdotally, you know, there's so many ways of, of feeling it. And, and, and right now where I am in coherence, it's like quite crazy. But I've, I don't like that part anymore. So I have somebody else to do that. But you used to like to fire people. I don't, don't, no, no. I, so I never liked it, but I didn't have the realization that I could get other people to fire people. <laughs> <laughs> no, how can I say this in a good way? How can I dig myself out of that hole? <laughs> no, but I, I think when I did it in 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 in, in played it, I, I just you know you 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 make the best out of it. You you align the goals with whoever's starting. Uh, if you feel it's not the right thing, you know you start talking with them. And a lot of the times, um, if they're typecast and I need to fit into a tightly integrated team, you kind of feel it, and they also feel it. And most of the times, I think of all I laid off and played it, there was only one that got angry at me. Everybody else, you know, it was more like conversation. They could see it didn't work out. And all of them came to another place afterwards where they were more happy. And that's also always what I said to myself. It's kind of, you know, it's, I didn't see it as me being an employer and me hiring. It's like, you know, we have, we have to work together. You, you have to have a good job. And I have to have a happy staff, uh, staff right? Um, but both in <laughs> coherence and jump ship, around, after around 15 people, uh, I hired a person like a COO, a director of studio in jump ship and a COO in, in coherence that are handling that. And I found out that's, that's a magical point. Because after 15 people, I didn't hire a person. And the company just grows. Yeah. I've been at company stuff where it's new people. Like, I'm not even only 30, but you know, I could come in and... There's just a lot of people and oh, these people start in three weeks and I didn't know. And I think it's magical when the company gets this life by itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, again, that's, I think that's the, for me at least that's the next level. Like how do you, I always thought about how do you hire yourself invaluable? You start the company and you always want to hire people that are better than you, that can replace you. And you just get pushed out at the top. And I mean, the perfect thing would be to just be pushed fully out and have this company that just lives and have the vision and have all the values and yeah. continue into infinite. That's a nice, uh, th that's a nice vision of the future to, uh, to wrap up. Thank you for the questions, by the way. Some great questions from uh, the audience. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. And uh, this concludes uh, this year's uh, Dutch uh, Game Day. Uh, you want to? Okay. Uh, then uh, we hope you uh, enjoyed uh, today. And then uh, we'll probably see you next year. Thank you. Bye-bye.